Hello. Hi. Uh, I can, uh, and I think it's it's a good morning. And but in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan, it's already good evening. It's uh, of course uh, nine nine uh, nineteen. Uh, okay. Seven seven p.m. We just uh, finished our work and had our uh, meals. <laughs> okay. And it's nearly night. And okay. I've just I've just shared uh, the link through to my group course mates and to my students and they will be joining soon. I think they have about more than five minutes. And until that time, we can we can just check out uh, our connections and All right. uh, screen share. Maybe it will be a little bit useful to start a little bit quickly, right? And yeah. As far as I'm concerned, you have two profiles, right? Candace Adams and Ken Adams, right? That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Let me just share the screen for mm -hmm. one of them. All right. Let me go back to there. Okay. I think I need to just okay. uh, give, you make me give, the cook. That's give, right. Give me permission. That's right. Okay. I provide it. All right. Uh, yep, it is. It is. It's showing. Yep. No. Oh, mm -hmm. very nice introduction. Oh. Tashkent State oh. University of Law. Oh, oh please. Feel privileged. Please. <laughs> <laughs> please. Very nice. It's, it's the least I can do. So yeah, it's oh, working, it right? Is. Yes. I'm just need to. Uh, I need to uh, make it a slideshow. There we are. Mm. Okay. Um, I saw I saw your uh, presentations in where I saw uh, somewhere. Call it European. European teachers, European teachers, teachers of legal English association. Was it right? Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it might have been something in London. Ah, probably. I, I saw this one. There was some. Yeah, that um, English, English uh, legal. Yeah, I, I don't can't remember the organization, mm. but I did something in London. Uh, um, yes. a you know maybe three years ago or so three years ago yeah i saw no uh, i thought it was very interesting and coincide of it was it was exactly uh european uh teachers of legal um, legal english association okay it, it okay. was uh, somewhere uh, i now i ca i cannot recall exactly uh, what that was <laughs> ashamed to say yep um and let's see the time. So still we have about three or four minutes and okay. let, let's wait till others join. And, no, of course, of course. Uh, probably uh, you, can, you can give some information about uh, yourself maybe. So I can give sure, you a quick I, introduction. Sure, you can, yeah, you can keep your part relatively short if you wish. And, uh, I can happily talk about myself. <laughs> um, and uh, I, um, I, um, I welcome any questions. Uh, you know, we can we can have doubtless some. So we're going for an hour and forty five minutes. Yeah, well, an hour and forty five. So it is that what you? It, it is that what you? Yep, yep, yep. It it will be a, a little bit late, I think, in Uzbekistan because. 
Well, you I tell me. Be... I, I, I thought that that was just the, that was what you had suggested initially. Uh, I can make it as long or as short as you wish. Uh, so, I think uh, about, about an hour or less fine. than an hour will be. Uh, okay, like fine, this. fine. Okay, that, well, that makes a difference. And yep, uh, let, let me give some uh, quick questions about yourself and so our audience will have some information about you and they are still joining and we are expecting about more, more than three or I have three groups and they, they will be joining also and three or more than three like this and they will be mainly uh, students and a couple of uh, teachers also my uh -huh. uh, colleagues at Tashkent State University of Law. And okay, uh, the first question, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, tell me about your works and your, your uh, fields of work, probably. Okay, so are we, is, is, we're starting now, is that? Uh... Uh, yep, surely, okay. we, we can start. Okay, fine. Well, hello everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. I'm. Uh, uh, I hope you're not too uh, too tired after a long day. We'll, we'll keep this uh, down to an hour, or maybe maybe a little less. We'll we'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm Ken Adams. I am a lawyer in the United States. I actually grew up overseas in various parts of Europe and Africa, and had most of my education until law school in England. But then I remembered I was American somehow and, and uh, came to the US for law school. And I've been in the US mostly since then with a few years in, in Switzerland. Um, but uh, my perspective is still generally you know, international. So I was at big US law firms doing deals when I realized that my brain was actually suited to a different sort of activity, figuring out what, uh, what works and doesn't work in contract language. So I started gradually devoting myself more to that. Um, and that reached its logical conclusion about, oh, I, how many years ago? 16 years ago when I stopped practicing law and devoted myself to my grand passion for contract language, as pathetic as that might sound. So um, one thing I do is, well, I've written a book called A Manual of Style for Contract Drafting. First published in 2004, that's a relatively small book. It has now turned into a 600 page hardback book. Um, and uh, that is the sort of foundation for, for my other activities, uh, which consists of, uh, I, I write other stuff, articles, I have my blog. I, um, I offer training uh, to organizations and to individuals. Um, it used to, I used to travel the world. Now I just do the Zoom thing. Um, and... Uh, I, I also, um, I have a, for the last year and a half, I've actually had a job for the first time in many years. I'm chief content officer of a company called Legal Sifter that uses artificial uh, intelligence to help with the contracts process, but uh, artificial intelligence with a difference in that it, it incorporates human expertise, um, including my expertise. So um, that, that is what I do. Um, and uh, now I'll give you just, I will give you a, uh, in our short time together, I will give you a sense of where things stand with contracts. Mm. And um, I'll, we'll, I'll, we'll look at a couple of areas where I've done research. So let's, the starting point is, all right, uh, what is the point of what I do? It's to help people be better informed consumers of contract language and better informed producers as well. Because th the idea is it is best to know what makes sense in contract language. If you're writing contracts, if you're re reading contracts, reviewing them, negotiating, it's best to know how contract language works. 
And the, the focus is what I, of what I do is on how you say clearly whatever you want to say in a contract. The question of what you say is a big topic depending on what kind of transactions you do, but you, the starting point has to be being able to say clearly whatever you want to say. Um, now, um, why do I think that's a worthwhile goal? Because the current state of contract drafting, dysfunction. Let me change the color of my pen and be to make it blue. That's what we want. Dysfunction. Traditional contract drafting works very poorly. When I was when I was a child, I assumed that things would just work. The world would work. People would figure out what works and they do it. I'm no longer a child, and I see that if anything. The state of the world is dysfunction. Stuff doesn't work unless people decide to make it work. And traditional contract language is dysfunctional. It doesn't work. It is silly in many respects. Um, we will look at some angles of that. Um, why do we care about the dysfunction? Because if your contracts are if what you say in a contract is expressed in a way that, that is just is not clear, doesn't make sense, everyone is going to waste time. Everyone's going to waste money in drafting, in reviewing, in negotiating, in monitoring performance. If your competitors are able to be more effective than you are, then that will hurt your business. And people routinely find that because of some drafting problem, they don't have what they expected to get under a contract. And if they're unhappy enough about it, they will get into fights. And I constantly see people getting into public, expensive, messy fights because uh, the drafting didn't work. And, and furthermore, uh, I, hey, I like, I like contracts, uh, perhaps more than mo most. But what I really don't like is working with dysfunctional contract language. When someone gives you a bad example of a contract and says, here, um, you know, create a new contract using this. And I say, uh, you know, that, that's not a happy activity. What is the explanation for the dysfunction? Um, whenever you need to do a contract for a new deal, People think, ah, oh, I'm going to use, I'm going to use that contract I did for that other deal, or someone will give you a contract. Here, we used this before. You say, okay, fine, that's that's helpful. But when you're using word processing, that means copy and paste, because you know, no, ideally, you take that contract and say, okay, well, thank you. I'm going to look to see, to make sure that it is as clear as possible and is as relevant as possible. But the way the world works, usually we say things like, oh, my boss gave me this contract. Well, I'm just gonna use the, con they gave me the contract, must be great. Or we'll say, um, I see there's problems with this, but we've been using this for years. I'm not gonna be the one to say, oh, let's stop, let's, let's, dismantle the machinery, let's fix the machinery, let's put it back together, that all takes time. I'm not gonna suggest to my organization that, that they've been doing things wrong. Or we'll say, I don't understand most of this. I don't wanna look stupid. I'm gonna pretend this makes sense. I'm gonna pretend I understand this. So the result is that we are all to some extent, riders of the copy and paste train. We just use what is given to us. And invariably what's given to us isn't great because it was created by someone else who was riding the copy and paste train. It's just, we've been copying on faith precedent contracts of questionable quality and relevance. And you can add to that the legalistic mindset. Legalistic means like a lawyer, but bad. The legalistic mindset is the lawyer says, oh, I don't want any risks, so I'm going to keep putting lots of words in there. 
And the legalistic mindset says, oh, let's create ridiculous distinctions between these words just to show that we're important and smart. So that complicates matters. So when you're, when you are um, riding the copy and paste train without a clear understanding of what's going on, the result is you're drafting without guidelines, without training, and you're saying things like, oh, the courts have told us what this language means, so it must be good. Um, whereas that, in fact, doesn't make sense, because if a court has had to look at contract language to figure out what it means, it's because that contract language is unclear. So I don't want to use tested contract language. I want to say clearly what the deal is in a way that the parties can understand it. So I'm going to use standard English. I don't use, I don't, um, use the phrase plain language or plain English because that makes people who do deals think that you're asking them to say things in a childish way. No, I'm I don't I'm not saying you should dumb down contracts. I just want I don't I just want to express them clearly using standard English, just normal English instead of weird mutant English, which is what uh, which is what contracts have long contained. I'm gonna follow a set of guidelines. In my book, A Manual Style for Contract Drafting um, is the only set of guidelines, comprehensive set of guidelines around. I, I remain surprised, but it's the case. Um, no one has felt, no one has wanted to spend 25 years buried in contract language the way I have. Um, that's, that might be what distinguishes me from others. I am a bit of a maniac. I like order. I like clarity. And so I'm going to spend 25 years working on it. So my book is the only comprehensive set of guidelines for traditional contract language. Um, Incidentally, I'm not sure I I don't really care whether someone is a lawyer or not a lawyer when it comes to contract language. Um, business contracts are not legal documents. They're business documents with a legal angle. And what is purely legal about contracts is generally the part that people care least about. So I, we ha there are different groups that work with contracts, the lawyers, the business people, the contract managers, the litigators, all sorts of people. I want everyone involved in contracts, but I want them all to be competent. And there's no reason why someone who isn't a lawyer can't be as competent or even more competent than a lawyer, because after all, lawyers have not done a great job at looking after contracts, because look at the state contracts are in. Um, training people is important and automation is important. Maybe we'll have a chance to discuss about that, that uh, a little later. Um, this, by the way, I'll send you this. I had, I'll send you a PDF of this PowerPoint presentation uh, when we're done. Um, this, this is an art, it was an article uh, maybe three, four years ago in Harvard Business Review. It reflects the perspective of modernized, what I call modernizers. You have traditionalists and then you have modernizers. That's my name for people who say, traditional contracts, bad. We can do better than that. How do we do better than that? Write clearly and use short sentences. And my response to that is, it's more complicated than that. You can't just say, write clearly, because my book is 600 pages long. And it's not 600 pages because I put in a lot of irrelevant stuff. It is 600 pages to tell you how to do this stuff properly because contracts, language contracts is limited and stylized and a lot is at stake. And so if you just say, hey, let's write clearly, you're gonna have some unpleasant surprises. So it's best not to be naive. And my response to this article was in this, this blog post that I, that I linked to there. 
Yes, people drafting contra uh, contracts in English around the world, they tend to go, they tend to base their contracts on English models or US models. But basically, um, the main difference there is the look of the contract between English you know, and other Commonwealth countries and US contracts. The language itself is essentially the same. So everyone around the world works in, with contracts in English. So here's a message for those of you uh, who don't speak, who, who don't, uh, who have English as a second or other language, who are not native English speakers. And you're, you're thinking of working with contracts? Well, the bad news is that a lot is at stake and everything matters. You can't just say, oh, the, I don't, this part, ah, it's probably not important. Everything matters in contracts. And there's no beginner's level. By that, I mean, it's not like you're learning French and you start out by learning to say, may I have a cup of tea? And then you, you learn more. With contracts, you're either not doing contracts or you're, you're in the thick of contracts. You are, you know, it's, it's, it's just one or the other. And if you're doing contracts, people are going to expect you to be able to look after yourself. So it's a kind of all or nothing proposition. But the good news is, hey, contracts are limited and stylized, and there's less to learn. And there's my book with a comprehensive set of guidelines. So it is manageable. It, no one's asking you to write a novel in English, a, st a big story. English is kind of annoying as a, a language to learn, but Contract language is limited and stylized. You can you can um, grasp the rules if you if you really if you apply yourself. So um, the world needs people who are competent in contract language, and if you if that's something you're interested in and you apply yourself, there'll be plenty of room for you. So we're, we are just, hey, we have uh, 45 minutes to just zip through some, some things. Like, okay, I, I generally start by discussing the front and the back of the contract. That's not where the important stuff is. But you see the same things in the front and the back of the contract. I've got all sorts of contracts. They, 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 they're very similar, whatever kind of the contract you have. And some of the silliest aspects of traditional contract drafting are in the front and the back. So it's a good way to get a sense of, of how just, well, what the problems are with traditional drafting and what a more modern format looks like. Hey, this, this is what the, the, the introductory clause and the recitals and the lead-in look like in my contracts. Pretty straightforward. Here is the traditional approach from just a random US contract. And you have things like, what is that? What is that? That is this from 500 years ago. And we're still doing it because that is the power of the copy and paste machine. People are scared to change stuff that isn't a contract they're given. Oh. Oh, this re represents the collective wisdom of the centuries. I can't change it. But there is so much that in, that in contracts that is nonsense because people have had that approach. Oh, I can't change anything. I don't understand it, but I can't change it. And so contracts are full of nonsense. So witnesseth and whereas, and now therefore, that's all. Anything that is in all capitals like that, just saying, I am archaic, please delete me. And you want to know what is the scariest recommendation I make in my 600 page book? The scariest thing? This is the scariest thing. This consulting agreement? Hmm, I go, um, Let's make that a small c and a small a, because in English, we don't give initial capitals to things. But the really scary part is, I say this consulting agreement is dated, but elsewhere in the contract, I'm just gonna say this agreement. 
I don't need to say this consulting agreement every time. I'm just saying this agreement to make it a little shorter. And I'm going to do this, that. I delete the definition. I'm, I'm, this creates a defined term for this agreement. Uh, contracts use defined terms like that, for example, just where, where we give a longer concept, a label. Well, this label is unnecessary and silly. So I say, no thanks. I'm just going to say this agreement, small a, like this consulting agreement, small c, small a. Also, I'm going to say this agreement, small a. Well, that freaks people out. Why? Well, be, uh, not because my change doesn't make sense, but just because every contract does this agreement with the define with the quotation marks. Oh, we created the defined term. They just that they just have a very hard time as riders of the copy and paste train, thinking independently and thinking, oh, I guess it's pretty silly. No, they are just used to copy and paste and not questioning. So it's just very strange. It's, this is not the most my most important change, but it just it scares people. So there you go. That's my that's my world. Um, hey, I'll take I'll I'll say uh, any question. And by the way, feel free to put something in chat or just shout out. Hey, yeah, Adams. surely. And to dear dear students, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop down this one on a chat box. Sure, and uh, I am I am eager for I, I'm I'm eager for uh, you to realize that just to realize how imperfect the current situation is, and yes. how. It can be made, and and to realize that there are there are guidelines for making things clearer, and to realize that that the the world of contracts, the world in general, and the world of contracts, is there for you to make better. Yeah, you know, me, I'm an old guy. I'm I've already done most of my work, so it's uh, we're looking to you. Uh, categories of contract language. That is, eh, I think uh, the that is, well, it's hard to say it's the most important topic. They're all important topics, but, but this is the foundation of controlled drafting. It's a, uh, well, it's, it's a challenging topic, but I think it's reassuring. Contracts are limited and stylized. They're a little like software code. They're o there's only certain kinds of things, certain kinds of meaning that make sense in a contract. So I came up with a framework that I call the categories of contract language. And it says, these the, every sentence in a contract falls into one of these categories language of performance obligation discretion prohibition policy declaration intention recommendation or it's going to be a condition expressed in three possible ways using a conditional clause language of policy or language of obligation um, i'm not i'm, I'm not going to explain the whole setup to you but i'll just give you a little flavor like language of performance that says things that happen automatically when the parties sign the contract. If this is in the contract between Acme and Smith, Acme hereby grants the license to Smith. The moment that they sign the contract, the license goes to Smith. And hereby is the, is the most distinctive element of language performance. It might sound like some weird, funny legal word, but it's actually used in standard English. I hereby pronounce you spouse and spouse. It means by saying this, I'm making it happen. Language of obligation um, comes in two forms. This slide relates to duties imposed on the subject of the sentence. 
Acme is the subject of the sentence. I use shall to impose a duty on the subject of the sentence. That is the only function I use shall for. And I have a, a, a test that I call the has a duty test. Can I replace a shall with has a duty? Has a duty to um, and have it make sense? Then if, if that works, then I know that shall is okay. If it doesn't work, then I have to use something other than shall. Uh, language of discretion, may, uh, but you can also say is, it might be helpful to say someone doesn't have to do something under a contract. I, I say is not required to for that. I group that with language of discretion, prohibition, shall not, language of, um, language of policy, that just says rules for how the contract works, not, not what a party has to do, can't do. You're just saying, hey, California law governs this agreement. This is, this is one of the rules governing how the contract works. And we're moving on, we're moving on, we're moving on. Um, and expressing conditions, that's where you say, for that other thing to happen, this has to happen first. We're not going to, you don't have to um, do this thing, but if you don't, that other thing won't happen. Here, but this is, this is a slide I want you to bear in mind. Language of discretion, may, yes, we like may, we give it two check marks. But what's all that about? Well, welcome to traditional contract language where you have all sorts of, <clears throat> different ways of saying the same thing with more words and less clearly. Like may, okay, may is great. How about is authorized to? Okay, we understand that, but that's three words. Why do I wanna use three words when I have may, one word? No, thanks. Shall have the right to? The shall doesn't work, but even then will have the right to? That's five words. Why would I wanna have five words? No, thanks, I'm gonna use may. And things can get really weird instead of, Acme may appoint. How about the customer hereby grants Acme the right to? Um, so it is. Um, it's just the uh, there are so there are so many ways of saying this saying may with more words and less clearly. This is that's because in traditional contract drafting you don't have my categories of contract language framework saying here are the different kinds of meaning. And here are verb structures that go with them. Instead, drafters have a random bag of verbs. And when they need a verb, they stick their hand in the random bag, feel around and pull something out and say, whatever. So it is chaotic. It is, this is an example of the chaos. Um, I will look at a chat question. Is contract language used in the area of intellectual property and artificial intelligence? Well, intellectual property, certainly. Um, I, I have my favorite intellectual property lawyer who, who explains this stuff to me, intellectual property, because intellectual property has a way of being weirdly complicated. So he explains the concepts to me and I say, okay, how about if we say them like this to make them clear? So I have written, some, if you look at my list of articles on my website, I've written some articles about intellectual property stuff saying, you know, patent licensing or trademarks. And I say, this traditional language, eh, do this instead. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. You want to be clear. There's just bear in mind, there's nothing. It's not a matter of dumbing things down. Oh, I'm going to say it really simple. No, we're just saying it clearly. Uh, being trying to make things simpler, that's one thing. If you can do that, fine. But being clear should be the priority. Um, and now in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, that's just the artificial intelligence is a is a is a way to try and make complexity more accessible. So it isn't so, so it's a, it's a tool rather than, you know, uh, our, uh, intellectual property is a subject matter that is used in contracts. Artificial intelligence is instead a tool 
that that uh, that a lot of people are trying to use to try and make contracts easier, the contracts process easier to work with. Um, the only thing I'll say about this is people use shall in, in the United States, certainly people use shall way too much. They use it in all these different ways. Um, I just use it one way to impose a duty on the subject of the sentence. And life is clearer when you do that. I'm not going to get into the whole shall discussion. Um, instead, here's the way my world works. For, with every sentence, I say, what category of contract language should this be? And I look at this, hmm, agrees to use reasonable efforts. Hmm, I think that should be language of obligation. And if I'm using language of obligation, imposing a duty on the subject of the sentence, I'm using shall. You say, why, who cares? What's wrong with agrees to? And I say, people get into fights over agrees to. There's a well-known intellectual property fight in the United States, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. Acme agrees to grant the license to Smith. There was a fight over whether, oh, is that language of performance? Is it happening the moment the contract is signed? The assignment is happening. That's what one party said. The other side said, no, agrees to. That's language of obligation. That's the duty to sign it later. So are we assigning when we sign the contract or are we assigning later? That is a classic fight that I keep seeing. I keep seeing examples of that fight. So you misuse verb structures, you get into fights. That's well, you, the main problem is you just, no, no one knows what they're doing, but it, and occasionally that results in fights. And this is an agrees to, a fight over agrees to is an example of that kind of fight. And oh, we, we just, you know, um, the deposit shall promptly be paid. The deposit has a duty to promptly be paid. No, that doesn't make sense. So I, we restructure that. That's this. This uses the passive voice. You have to, to. I'm not a grammar guy, but there's some fundamental notions of English grammar that you need to grasp if you want to really understand contract language. One of those is the active voice and the passive voice. And we keep going. We keep going. I'm not going to take your time over this. But the, the end result is I can take any contract. I'm, I'm, I'm such an exciting guy. I can take any contract and say, hey, look at all these problems. I'm great fun at parties. Look at this contract page. Show me any contract page. I'll show you the verb structure problems. So supplier agrees that. What's the problem with supplier agrees that? Well, it's... Um, it's a contract. We know the parties are agreeing to this stuff. So supplier agrees that licensee shall have the right to, like, why are you telling me you're agreeing to this stuff? We know you're agreeing to this. And there, so my book has an example of redundant verb structures at the front like this and agrees that is one of them. So agrees that I know I'm not going to use degrees that agrees that is on the forbidden list. That's my make believe list of words and phrases I'm not going to use in a contract because they're too, they're, they're a waste of time or they're confusing and agrees that is on the forbidden list. It's just, I don't want it in my contracts. Then, oh, licensee shall have the right to. Hmm, does that shall pass the has a duty test? Licensee has a duty to have the right to? That doesn't make sense. What category of contract language should this be? Should be discretion. Licensee may authorize. Licensee may reject. Agrees to. No, that's language of obligation. And so on. Here's an English contract. The issuer authorizes each of the dealers on behalf of the issuer to provide. How about each? How about um, each of the dealers? may, language of discretion. Again, this is just one of the many unhelpful ways of saying may. So you just have to you get used, you develop habits. You get used to seeing language and recognizing the issue. 
it starts off slow, but it gets, as you get used to it, um, it gets faster until you just, you're able to diagnose, you see the patterns up, oh, you ask the questions, ah, oh, does this pass the hazard duty test? What category of contract language should this be? You ask yourself these questions with every sentence and you develop a habit. It be, you become like a kind of software uh, encoder in a way, because you, you, you see the patterns that are just limited and stylized and you know how it works. Huh. And in the chat, I will put something in the chat. Um, that, is, that is the blog post where you'll find a link to a quick reference chart to the categories of contract language. It's from my book. It's just, you know, uh, two and a half pages or whatever, just saying, here is how, here are the different categories of contract language. Here are examples. Here's how it works. The rest of the chapter explains the detail and shows how you can mess things up and the mistakes people make, is the, make the confusion they cause. But that chart just gives you a basic idea. Ambiguity, I spend quite a lot of, oh, any question? Any uh, observations? Yeah, this, I'm sure this is gonna be, this is scary in in an hour mm, i think but, the questions will be at the end of well, okay uh, presentation yeah. fine all right well keep uh, sources of okay the contract language can create uncertainty different kinds of uncertainty ambiguity where you have different possible meanings and vagueness vagueness is where you use a word like promptly how fast is promptly? I don't know. It depends on the circumstances. So people can get into fights over vagueness. But vagueness is an essential tool for the drafter uh, to be used carefully when you can't be precise. So vagueness, yes, necessary, use carefully. Ambiguity, always bad news when you have alternative possible meanings. And the book has, has um, a lot on the different kinds of ambiguity. You know, the words like offshore. Oh, what does offshore mean? Does it mean it's just in the ocean water? Or does it mean you have to be off the coast of the United States? People have had fights over offshore. Your know, words that aren't in contracts every day, suddenly they have alternative possible meanings. But there's some words like willful that you see in contracts all the time that are just always going to be confusing. So I never use willful. It is on the forbidden list too. How about, oh, there, there confusion when you point to something you already mentioned and the readers say, which one? So when you're, oh, which, oh, there, this contract has, talks about two sums. Which, which one are you talking about? You can even get into a fight over here under, kind of, you know, does that mean under this, in accordance with this section, in accordance with this contract, or does it mean lower down in the contract? People, it, it seems silly to get into a fight over here under, but an unhappy contract party will beat you with whatever stick it, it has available. And if here under is that stick, well, that's what it'll use. Just people end up fighting over the strangest thing. They fight over references to time. The option expires on 18 January. Ah, uh, how much time do I have? I don't know. Because when you give, when you um, refer to a point in time by reference to a day, when in the 24 hours does the point in time occur? I don't know. Let's have a fight over it. Ah. Uh, Ambiguity of the part versus the whole. Acme shall not dissolve subsidiary A or subsidiary B. What does that mean? And I tell you, it means it has four possible meanings. Um, don't dissolve A or B or both. Or uh, shall dissolve neither A nor B. Don't dissolve anything. Um, but it could also mean, oh, uh, don't dissolve A or B, dissolve 
nothing or dissolve both of them. Don't leave us with one. Anyway, this example is in the book of four possible meanings. Why? Because contract language is limited and stylized and people, and a lot is at stake. So people look more closely at contract language than, than, than most other kinds of writing. So you can have a fight over Jones may purchase each vehicle included in the row assets. Does that mean they purchase one or more vehicles? Or does it mean you buy nothing or you buy the entire fleet of vehicles? I don't know. Let's have a fight about it. People just get into fights over this. This ambiguity is caused by plural nouns and and or each, any, all, and every. It's the question is, are you talking about one member of the group or all the members of the group? And people get into fights. In the past six months, I've written about a fight over and. I've written about a fight over any. People get, if, a lot, if enough is at stake and people have access to justice, they get into fights over and and or and any and all and so on. Uh, syntactic ambiguity. Here's the modifier. What does it modify? Just that? Or does it also modify that? So the question is, may Acme sell adult accessories or footwear? If the answer is no, it's all for children, I'd say children's apparel, children's accessories, children's footwear. If Acme may sell adult accessories and footwear, I'll put children's apparel there because that way the only thing that children's modifies is apparel anyway. We keep going. People get into big fights over syntactic ambiguity. This is a fight from 2007. I was the expert witness. It was a, that became known as the case of the million dollar comma. People don't understand commas. That's one thing I've learned. Judges don't understand commas. People who work with contracts don't understand commas. Here's another fight over a, involving a comma. Don't rely on commas. People don't understand them. So um, just under, learning this stuff, it's entirely possible. My book has lots of information, but you have to be paranoid. You have to be the software code person. You just have to, uh, you have to, um, you know, if you're in an environment where contracts matter, a lot is at stake and there's access to justice, these are things you have to know. Okay, wow. selected usages. I have a big chapter called selected usages, which is just words or phrases that uh, don't fit anywhere else that, that have, have something interesting to say about. But the most interesting selected usage is now has a chapter of its own. It's about efforts, or in England, endeavors, provisions, best endeavors, reasonable endeavors, best efforts, reasonable efforts. It is a, it's, it's an amazing topic. Um, see all these different efforts provisions? I looked at an online database years ago and came up with this list. Now I have this, this is in my book. Um, and it just says, for efforts provisions, there are things you need, like you need a verb, you need a noun, but there's this other stuff that you can include if you want. So the result is you have lots of different efforts provisions. But the core question is, what's the difference between best efforts and reasonable efforts? People around the world who work with contracts will tell you that, well, essentially, efforts provisions are needed because sometimes you can't just say you have an obligation to do this because the person doesn't have complete control. Like they have to, you know, sell, sell stuff, or they have they need permits from a government agency. They don't control it. The government agency is the one who decides. So saying ACME shall obtain the government permits seems a little unfair. ACME shall use reasonable efforts to obtain the government permits because it is an incomplete control. Okay, fine. Um, but the thing is, 
you ask people who work with contracts around the world what the difference between best efforts and reasonable efforts is, best in efforts and reasonable in efforts, is that they will say that reasonable, reasonable efforts, just do whatever is reasonable. Best means you have to try harder. And I've devoted a lot of time to explaining why that doesn't work. It's an amazing disconnect. People around the world think this one thing and it doesn't make sense. That's why courts in the US have said different efforts provisions change the amount of effort, the amount of work you have to do, the, 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 how hard you have to try. No. So US courts have said, no, we don't accept that. Uh, but they don't, they, but the English, uh, people around the world who think that there's a difference never explain it. They just say, that's the way it is. US courts, in saying, no, they haven't explained it either. Um, English courts and Canadian courts say the difference between efforts and endeavors standards, yes, that exists, but the, the reasons they offer are pathetic. So essentially, um, I thought after writing about efforts for a long time, I thought it's time to do something, try and do something serious, which in my world means writing a long article. So in 2019, I wrote a law review article explaining all of this. And uh, it actually ended up working out because um, the Delaware Chancery Court, which is the, the, the best known court in the United States for business matters, said that Adams is the leading authority on efforts provisions. And my article is the, 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 the most comprehensive analysis. So just that's the kind of thing I try and do to just explain what makes sense to people who really are just more interested in riding the copy and paste train. So what I do just goes up against the fairy tales that people tell each other when they're riding the copy and paste train. They just, they just make stuff up. And I come along and say, hey, what you're telling each other doesn't make sense. You know, I know you might not like hearing that. People might not like hearing that, but ultimately, if we want contracts to work, we can't rely on fairy tales. So I'll spare you all that. It was kind of, it was fun aspects like um, using corpus linguistics, looking at data on how, for example, in the last 200 years, reasonable endeavors has been used. Saying, oh, well, reasonable endeavors is not standard English. Best endeavors is standard English. Okay. Whew. All right. So things don't work. So how do we change things? I look at it from the perspective of people who work with contracts and organizations. And for people to, who work with contracts, I don't know to, the, to, to what extent any of you have, have worked with contracts, but if you want to work with contracts, the starting point has to be, be an informed consumer of contract language. And the only way to achieve that is through my book. I know that's, uh, that sounds big headed, but it's just nothing else comes close. The, okay, e-version of the book. All right, here's the deal. Um, you can buy an e-version of the book from the American Bar Association. Um, I, can, I could arrange for a discount, but it's going to be about $85. The regular price is, is $119.95. If you're, if you're interested in... in, in um, getting you know students kind of pitching in to buy print copies um i can or i can ask the american bar association to give you my corporate disc my corporate rate which is 
$41.98 per copy instead of $119 plus, plus shipping to Uzbekistan. But still, if, there are enough, if, if enough people are interested, you essentially place one order for a number of the books and they'd be 42 bucks, $42. So, which is, it's still money, but it's one third the price, uh, the, the regular price. So I just mentioned that. If, 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 if that's of interest, just let me know. So my book is the only way, is just the only way to be a seriously informed consumer of contract language. Um, I, someone, I was, amused, I was gratified to have someone point out to me a few months ago, hey, hey, Adams, look at this job posting. A, uh, a well-known company was a, wanted to hire someone to work with contracts. And one of their conditions was must own a copy of a manual style for contract drafting. So, so the book is, is getting recognized as being the resource. Um, but uh, that's the main thing for you to, to learn. You know, ultimately, the, this point is just to, just to say that if you're, if you're reviewing contracts, the, your job isn't to turn the other side's draft into a thing of beauty. You just focus on problems, things that don't, that don't reflect the deal as you understand it or things that can create confusion. You don't try and make it all nice. Um, one problem is that, um, no, oh, here, actually, I'll forget about that. Um, the next, so basically you have to be an informed consumer of contract language. But from the perspective of an organization, I think you need more than that because you can't just train individuals and say, okay, do our contracts because there'll still be a bunch of individuals with different experience, different education, different talents. If you want a rigorous contracts process, you need some centralized initiatives. You have to have central control. Um, one starting point is to adopt a style guide for contract drafting. That is an idea that is catching on. I used to think my book would be a style guide but uh, it's just too big. It's, it's six, you can't give a 600 page book to all your contracts people and say, here, do this. Um, but um, uh, at the moment, my book is the only thing out there. And I think if we want a shorter one, I'm the only person who's gonna do it. Um, so I have prom, I, I've, I already prom, I'm late. I'm late in delivering the short book, the 150 pages or something that just says, do this, don't do that. And with a little bit of explanation, I, I will, um, I have to deliver that in the next year and a half. Otherwise there'll be big trouble. So, so you can look for that. Then you train people and you redraft templates, redrafting templates. I have clients who say, thank you for your training session. We were inspired and we spent a year and a half doing a new template master services agreement. I say a year and a half. I just keep seeing these, um, like that article in the Harvard Business Review. They said, we spent three years redoing our templates. Three years. Ah, It's just people spend too long. That's because they, they take, they draft by committee. They have meetings where people who don't really understand contract language just talk about, oh, what do we use this, that, I don't know, you know, they, it just, that's not an efficient process. For that, uh, instead, you should hire contract drafting specialists like me. But even then, I've learned that it's harder than that. Why? Because inertia, people don't like change. I had big companies hire me to redo their templates. I'd say, here's your 80 page patent license agreement. It's clear, it's great. And, they, and half the time they would say, we can't use it, it's too different. So it's just, I constantly see people have a hard time changing. So 
That is why I'm now focusing on automation. With, legal, with that company, Legal Sifter, I'm helping with automated review of contracts. You upload the draft you got from the other side, and Legal Sifter will tell you stuff about that draft. But my true ambition is a library of automated, annotated, customizable templates. You answer a questionnaire, you read the annotations, you know, for you to create your master services agreement. You answer 78 questions or whatever it is. And the system then pulls together language that complies with my guidelines, language that is created with the help of subject matter experts. So you get a customized, clear, comprehensive draft instead of riding the copy and paste train. We have to get rid of the copy and paste train. We need new quality language to come into the system instead of recycling stuff. So wish me luck in, uh, in being able to uh, build such a system because it was for that that I started writing the book 20 whatever years ago. Okay, we have some time for questions. If anyone has any questions, I will I will email um, I will email the presentation um, to Sardor um, yep. the moment the moment we we hang up, and you will find on my blog uh, if you're interested in contracts, there is there are loads of articles. There's two and a half thousand blog posts. There's a lot. There's probably too much. The book is the is the most organized way of looking at things. But uh, if you don't have the book, um, the the, uh, the blog and articles and so on will be helpful. Yeah, and thank you, Adam, for your very useful information. Our students are really interested in contracts, and of course, uh, I think we have a couple of books uh, probably in our library because uh, we are official. Uh, tallest examination and preparation center and oh. probably your book is also in a uh, tallest legal website right uh if, if well not the, not, not, uh, maybe a link to it but uh, mm. not the text of the book there are the, you'll see that um uh on my website you uh, there are links to the table of contents index preface introduction and uh, and the, there's also uh, uh a website that has, you know, it's called Word Rake, W O R D, mm. uh, Word Rake, uh, R A K E, that has the chapter on syntactic ambiguity. So that that's that, if you search for Adam syntactic ambi ambiguity, you will find that chapter PDF online somewhere, hosted by Word Rake. I just mentioned that. So so there are parts of the book that are available for free. And just generally, I am alarmingly accessible. If you email me a question, mm -hmm. I'll reply. <laughs> if it's a sense, halfway sensible question, I'll reply. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I, will, I will share uh, your screen share and your PowerPoint presentation with mm -hmm. our students. And I, I also include your email address so others can have later connection to ask okay. their questions, probably. Sure. Then let's see. Okay. Uh, we, can, we can devote a couple of minutes, about five or 10 minutes for the last questions. Okay. And students, feel free to ask your questions. We have very experienced, uh, one of the, the only, I, I think, the only. Thank you, they, of course, the only. Um, <laughs> expert in um, contracts. Yeah. Well, no. Hey, so it's I'm, a great no. chance. How to, to say stuff questions. clearly? Um, is anyone anyone contemplating working with English language contracts? Uh, Just out, out of curiosity. I think, uh, and right here, we have no one who works with contracts for mm -hmm. now. Uh, but but no, of course, well, now. you are and students. Because, that's why yeah. <laughs> because, you are students. Yeah, probably they they. They can use this knowledge in the future, and as I said, I think it's we need competent people, and showing yourself, uh, you know, it's it is man, it is it's not easy, but if you have, the materials are there, 
for you to make yourself an informed consumer of contract language. And that is a bit of a, a revolutionary step. Um, uh, yeah, being, being in, I mean, in a world where everyone is copying and pasting, being an informed consumer of contract language, that says a lot. Um, uh, I am, um, well, besides my blog, I'm on Twitter. Hmm. Um, being pretty, pretty silly on Twitter. Just um, <laughs> the, the, um, uh, the phrase is, well, a, a vulgar phrase, shit posting. I should, I just, I, I look at, do, I look at terrible contracts and say, look, here's a screenshot of this terrible contract. Isn't that, you know, let's all laugh at this stupid stuff. So I do that sort of thing. It's not very grown up, but what the heck, I have to entertain myself. Um, yeah, so uh, my blog, oh, I'm, and I do stuff on LinkedIn, but I find LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a, yeah, it's, it's not a great marketplace of ideas. It's a lot of self-promotion. So I, I, I post stuff on LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn group for my book. Mm. Um, manual style for contract drafting. Um, not a whole lot goes on in that group. Um, so most of the action is on my website, and and then but then hey, you know, on Twitter, if you just let me know, hey, I'm uh, I'm with the uh, Tashkent group. I'll know I'll know who you are. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I've, comment about, uh, okay, I reviewed several contracts after by Norton Rose Fulbright. Uh, yeah, it was great, but boilerplate clause is quite difficult to catch. I am, um, um, yes, I have something you might find of interest um, is, uh, I will see if I can quickly, quickly pull it up and put the link. Um, it is a collection of my boilerplate materials. Boilerplate is the is the um, miscellaneous provisions at the, you find at the end of a contract, the same stuff in contract after contract, notices, provision, governing law, that sort of thing. Well, um, uh, I've, I've done a lot of research about that. And um, I, think peop I think you would find, if, if you want to know more about that, you would find uh, my stuff interesting. Um, and just generally, the big I've I have done. If you search for the phrase "magic circle" on my website, you will find my blog post about just a random contract drafted by one of the big English law firms, and of course, it was terrible. Um, it was uh, it because all the big law firm stuff is terrible. I mean, that is something you have to appreciate. You don't realize how bad stuff is out there. You think, oh, these prestigious organizations, they're doing a great job. Look at, search on my website for uh, Salesforce Master Subscription Agreement. Um, I, did, I did videos, I did analyses, I did reviews of the Salesforce Master Subscription Agreement. And the conclusion is, Salesforce, like lots of other organizations, has lots of resources to do a good job and said they did a bad job. They did an embarrassing job. Are they different from any other big company? No, everyone does a bad job. It's just, it is unnecessary. It's, it's, it's just, I want a functioning civic society. For functioning civic society, we need civic functions like contracts to work. Um, okay, the, okay, let's see. Um, uh, the most challenging to resolve, let's see. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually think, I think in terms of what topics are challenging. Currently, I'm, I'm, re I'm rethinking my work on the word material. Embarrassingly, my, I now know that the, my current analysis isn't good enough, and I'm I'm starting to to investigate to, to see whether the analysis I I have in mind works. So that is my that's the challenge I'm working on now. And hey, that, that's in my world, 
that is fun working on that stuff thinking it through coming and just thinking coming up with analyses that no one else has come up with that's exciting how can we avoid the misunderstanding of contract oh uh, misunderstanding of the contract due to uncertainty well vagueness is essential so there's probably you know there you can't escape vagueness you just have to realize that it is a source of uncertainty you keep it to a minimum and you just you do what you can so there always be places where you need to use efforts provisions a word like promptly that's vagueness but ambiguity uh no you don't want ambiguity how do you avoid misunderstanding you become expert at recognizing ambiguity and how to avoid it. How do you become an expert? By reading my book. You read my book, you are you know as much as I do. You might even be better because I, you know, I'm the book is the best version of me because me, I forget stuff. And I you know, so so uh, the book has everything you need to be expert at avoiding ambiguity. So that's how you make yourself useful in this world. You just you you learn stuff that other people just cannot be bothered to learn or just don't have the resources or the mentality to learn. Whew. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, what well, thank you. And and I've I've it's it's late and I've occupied enough of your time. Nah, that uh, no, not not much. And huh. yeah, it, it is a little bit uh, late uh, in Uzbekistan, and I think. Uh, if we don't have any questions left from the audience, yep, uh, we, we, can, we can just have finish our presentation. And uh, at the end of our meeting, I would like to thank you one more time. And it's a great honor to have you in our university, and even if just a uh, just a group of students. And uh, your knowledge, your experience is really uh, precious to the, especially to the low students and mm -hmm. probably they, they can use this uh, knowledge and the, the thing you shared in the future. And thank you one more time. We appreciate your time okay. and your efforts. My pleasure. And as I say, don't hesitate to contact me and best of luck. Uh, with what, whatever your undertakings, particularly if it's related to contracts. So mm. thank you and, uh, and goodbye. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for everyone to joining. Now have a nice day. Bye-bye.